This is Michael Woodward, and this is Season 3, Episode 224 of the Jumble Think Podcast. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Jumble Think, where we interview amazing entrepreneurs about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality too. Our guest on today's episode is Rana Guja. More about Rana in a moment. If you haven't subscribed to our podcast already, I encourage you to go do it right now. We have over 200 episodes with amazing guests and great topics, all helping you turn those dreams and ideas into reality. It's simple to subscribe. Go to wherever you like to listen to podcasts and search for the Jumble Think Podcast. For iTunes or Apple Podcasts, simply go to jumblethink.com slash iTunes. And for Spotify, all you have to do is head on over to jumblethink.com slash Spotify. Now let's jump into today's episode. Hey there, welcome to Jumble Think. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host. We have an incredible episode lined up for you today. I am so excited about today's episode. Our guest is Rana Gujra. Now, who is Rana? Rana is an entrepreneur, speaker, investor, and CEO of Behavioral Signals, an enterprise software company that delivers a robust and fast-evolving emotional AI engine that introduces emotional intelligence into speech recognition technology. Rana has been awarded the Entrepreneur of the Month by CIO Magazine and the U.S. China Pioneer Award by IEIE. He has been listed among top 10 entrepreneurs to follow in 2017 by Huffington Post. He's also been featured as a speaker at the World Government Summit in Dubai, the Silicon Valley Smart Future Summit, the IEIE in New York. He is a contributing columnist to TechCrunch and Forbes. This is a super fun conversation. We are going to talk about AI. We're going to be talking about entrepreneurship. We're going to be talking about risk and what it looks like. This is going to be a lot of fun. So let's dive into the conversation we had with today's guest, Rana Gujra. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Michael. It's a sincere pleasure to be here. I uh, have spent some time, as as we always do, researching what you do. Uh, I have to say that we've had uh, some guests that are in the AI space, but not doing what you're doing. So I'm excited to have that conversation talk about your larger picture of entrepreneurship and your journey into it. Uh, First off, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. A sure thing. Uh, first off, again, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, to this platform. Uh, really excited to have this conversation. Um, so my my current role is a, a CEO of Behavioral Signals. Uh, Behavioral Signals is an exciting AI company. Uh, we focus on deducing human emotions from voice data, and what we call emotion AI, and we deliver that capability into a variety of different verticals as a platform um, in the form of what we call as emotion as a service. And so um, when we apply that tech into verticals such as inside sales, contact centers, um, you know, BPOs and call centers, et cetera, we go after specific KPIs such as matching the right agent to the right customer, uh, giving agents the right tool uh, when they're speaking to the client, uh, for example, you know, giving them very specialized signals such as propensity to buy and propensity to pay. Uh, but when we when we apply it to say a completely different vertical such as a healthcare uh, vertical, we, we're working with a company uh, that is um, managing a platform uh, that that uh, that caters to patients with depression, and they use our technology to uh, predict a propensity for societal behavior. Very different use case compared to managing uh, agent engagement. Um, and, 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 and you know, similarly, we apply the tech to a variety of different use cases in virtual assistants and robotics. So for example, any place where there's a human to machine interaction, uh, we make that machine be more human-like by giving that machine or that software system an ability to understand the emotion being felt uh, behind the words that a human is speaking. And so, you know, a lot of interesting use cases, we can deep dive into it. So that's what we do at Behavioral Signals. Uh, that's what I do currently. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, my, my background, I've been 
an entrepreneur for uh, for uh, for a while. Um, my initial journey started out um, as uh, as an engineer. Um, then you know I was in corporate for a long time, building a variety of different products, hardware, software, everything in the middle. Um, I had an interesting opportunity to go turn around uh, a company that was tinkering on bankruptcy. Uh, we could talk about that, and that kind of yeah. stuff like pivoted me out of my corporate world, and I've never looked back. And I think it's been such a rush over the last seven years, uh, more so actually, more like so seven, eight years. But uh, it's um, you know, I don't have many regrets. The one is that, hey, why did I do that sooner? <laughs> <laughs> so, so good. We're going to talk a little bit about behavioral, uh, behavior signals a little bit later in uh, the episode. I, I want to go back for you and get kind of a ground uh, level story of, of entrepreneurship and how you got there because uh, it sounds like you've done a couple different things. So how did you end up doing the entrepreneurial journey and going down that road? You know, um, someone asked me this question, is that did you always have this venue or did you sort of, uh, you know, get this inspiration later in the day, later in the years? And I'd have to say, candidly, you know, unlike uh, brilliant entrepreneurs I meet every day, you know, in their 20s and, you know, some in their teens. Yeah. Um, I just wasn't, I just didn't have uh, that clarity or that insight that this is what I wanted to do. So I followed a very traditional path of, um, you know, getting my education done, um, getting, uh, getting a job, um, which back then, I mean, I was very passionate about computer science, so I wanted to be an engineer. And then, you know, eventually just, um, you know, adding value and growing through the organization on the corporate ladder. Um, and I never really, I mean, I knew that there was something lacking and I was not really you know, feeling that satisfaction of this is what I was supposed to, you know, uh, supposed to do, and this is not my calling. But you know, I, I and I, I never really uh, thought that I should be an entrepreneur. And uh, you know, a part of that is, you know, I, I feel that there is this there's this inert ability to manage and perceive risk, um, okay. and some some have it. On day one, some have it when they're like in their early teens and they yeah. just they just sort of jump into it. I mean, they don't care about the education. They don't care about what others feel about them. They'll just go at it and they, they'll be persistent. And for others, most of us, like, you know, and I'm definitely in that bucket. I, I went the safer route. I had to build up that strength. I had to build up that strength by sort of checking off all those things which was expected of me. And getting to a point where I had sort of secured those things uh, that I had the confidence, okay, I should be taking more risks. I should be um, getting out there and trying out new things. And and part of that was having that safety net and that security built out uh, with those check marks of achieving those things. And part of that was being bored with not having enough challenge because I've already done those things, which I, I started out to do and had reached those um, milestones and I, I just didn't know what else would be more challenging so I had to go try out other things um, and so I, I started off much later in my career I mean um, that's when uh, you know how, how I became an entrepreneur I love to talk about that what, what led to it and what I did <laughs> yeah well let's let's do that uh, so it sounds like uh, your journey uh, was one of discovery and, and that the discoveries along the way, whether it was learning about engineering, uh, I'm, I'm sure, uh, technology engineering uh, in, in the school you went to or the process of saying, hey, this isn't challenging me in the way I want. All of that journey kind of led you to the place where you said, oh, this entrepreneurial, this executive role, this creative role of starting and launching companies, that's that's what I'm born to do. It sounds like that that these were all building blocks to give you the tools so that you could e excel in those areas, whereas a lot of entrepreneurs come in uh, from an early day and and they have to, to learn it from uh, – from hard knocks of of trial and error and fa failure, you are doing the same thing, but you learned it and then kind of jumped into it because you were wanting more. Yeah, I I, I agree. I mean, I think it was more for me. It was more of wanting more. Um, well, it, there's one more thing, right? Yeah, so okay. I've had, I've had um, some amazing mentors in my in my life, and I'm really thankful of that. Uh, they they've given me some early career advice that has stuck with me, and I've 
navigated the, the you know the course of my career uh, and in a sense course of my life using some of those and you know really internalizing some of those values and principles one of them has been this was an advice that was given to me uh, by one of my earliest mentors when I was like just starting out uh, okay. out of school and the advice was um, you know uh, basically sort of the, this person sort of walked me through this analogy is like look you're soon you're gonna have two options uh, when you go look for a job you're going to have this one job that everyone wants it's gonna be at this tier one company it's going to be at that hot sexy uh, you know uh, company that is looks great on your brand you're gonna work with really smart people um, you know the best of the best and the best processes and it's going to pay you a lot of money. And that the second option you would have would be at an unproven company, uh, maybe a startup, or maybe even you know a company that is uh, falling apart, has got a toxic culture. You know um, there are a lot of problems, and they want you to come in and add value. And what would you typically pick? Most would pick the former because that's a safer choice, and that kind of sounds good. That's what the parents would tell you to do. Um, but you know, you'd add so much more value and you would grow so much uh, if, if you take the latter choice. And so it's, it's sort of like this principle of embrace discomfort and chaos is a ladder, seek it. And so when you go into that, um, that, that, that situation, that environment where, uh, there are a lot of things that are not going right. And then you come in and you add a little bit of value. That little bit of value is magnified because um, you, you're perceived as ma making a huge difference and that what's led to leads to your growth versus you know adding value similar amount of value in a very functional well-oiled machine um, you're just one of the many yeah and one of the people doing the same things and so your incremental growth is very very small and so I've always sort of had that stuck with me and as I've grown through my career I've always sort of you know questioned hey uh, am I now too comfortable um, you know, is this challenging enough? Am I learning or is this more of just sort of adding incremental value? And every time I've gotten to that point where I've realized that, yeah, it's now in my comfort zone and then I've moved out, I've quit, right? And so I've gone to uh, the next thing and I've taken on a new role or a new opportunity. And so but it just so happened that I spent a uh, early part of my career doing that in, in the corporate environment. And that led me to a lot of growth. I mean, I rose quickly through the ranks and I got to the sea level real quick. Um, but I got to a point where um, it, it just sort of like even at that even at that level, it was sort of now moving the needle and sort of like you know just focusing on the same old things in different roles. And so I had to sort of really get out. I had to like, okay, well, it's not, it's not fun anymore. It's not challenging anymore. And now I have to take a bigger risk and the bigger risk has to be outside of the, the corporate dynamics. I have to do something entirely different. Um, and that's kind of what led me into entrepreneurship. Um, it was a combination of not being challenged enough, um, partly because I was bored and, you know, and third, lastly, I mean, it's like that, that principle of embracing discomfort. Yeah. Now had led me to a new level, yeah. and I kind of I, I felt that you know uh, you know that was more of it versus that was my calling. That's what I always wanted to do. Uh, but you know I you know I, I feel I, I, if I'd done it a lot sooner, I would have been a lot more happier. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that I find interesting about what you're saying is that uh, in Western culture and Western civilization, our uh, and, and it might be like this in other uh, philosophies of, of, of life, whether it's Asian or, or kind of more of a Latin feel or whatever. I don't know. I can't speak to that because, uh, you know, I've only been to some of these places a few times. But uh, it's in, in Western culture, the, uh, the mantra that we're told and sold is that we need to play it the safe way. Here's the route you need to do. You need to do this followed by this. This is the path to success. This is the way you're supposed to do it. And it's safe, it's comfortable, it's uh, a known path. And I love that you say embrace the discomfort because that is something that we don't do well in America. We don't. We want to run from discomfort. We want to run from uh, run towards the quick dollar, the easy way, uh, the clear cut way, the way that is safe. So, yeah. 
how do we navigate that place of going, you know, there's so much more we could do if we're willing to move from safe to the place of discomfort. And then how do we navigate uh, living in a place of discomfort, but knowing that we're growing and we're building something that really has significance? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I think, you know, um, you're right. I mean, a lot of, lot of the mindset, um, first off, it is all about the mindset, as you said. Yeah. And then second off, um, a lot of the mindset is environmental. And, um, you know, it's, it's like, you know, what, what you see and what you absorb and what you internalize and that becomes your mindset and what you see around you and your, your, your bar for risk. Um, is um, is gauged by uh, or is is tempered by what you see around yourself as risk. And you know if you are in an extremely chaotic uh, environment or you are surrounded by extremely high risk takers, uh, your your bar for risk is very high. Uh, versus if you are uh, in a very structured environment where you expect certain things, certain certain comforts, and certain capabilities in place. Um, then, then you don't take risk. I mean, in fact, sometimes it's hilarious. Sometimes you're thinking you're taking risk, but if you tell that to someone else, it's like, okay, is that risk really? <laughs> and, you know, yeah. It's not. <laughs> and so, um, and I think those, those that realization comes uh, with experience, with time. It's also, you know, a lot of that is environmental. I, 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 there's one thing I'd like to share. Or there's, you know, uh, someone asked me this earlier, is how do you see opportunities? Um, okay. And I think, I mean, I reflected on that, which is, look, I mean, everyone has had uh, different uh, life experiences. And, you know, I grew up in a very different household than you um, and have had different uh, value systems and different experiences, some good, some bad, um, and different challenges, which has shaped me in a thousand different ways. And that has then led me to um, see certain things differently and then, than someone else. And so... Uh, when an opportunity presents us and, you know, like, for example, you know, if I had to say, like, you know, what I did in my early on in my career, um, I had a lot of opportunities to pivot out. I had a lot of opportunities to go be an entrepreneur, um, which um, others did uh, who I knew. I mean, and I mean, back then we were both presented with the same opportunity, but I, I didn't I didn't take those. And those those other people saw them as opportunities. But. It's my, it's sort of like, you know, how we see things and how we see things is um, sort of uh, framed by uh, how, you know, how our life experiences have shaped us. And so opportunities are not equal for everyone because we don't see them as opportunities uh, equally. I mean, I could see something as an interesting uh, situation and other, other person could see that as a, this is a life changing opportunity. I have to go jump and do this. And um, that's kind of how it happens. And so for us, like, you know, my risk taking ability uh, has gone up over the years and uh, it, it just wasn't that high back in the day. I mean, I had to sort of, you know, go make those safer choices. And then I had to sort of learn from others. I sort of like, I've been curious and say, hey, why is someone doing that? And what's the outcome? And, you know, what if they fail and then realize that, hey, I mean, okay, it's not a big deal. You fail, but you know, the price is a big, you know, it's, 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 it's worthy exercise to do it. And so to your point, I think embracing discomfort, a big part of that is, um, you know, being okay with failure, but that's a cliche term. What does that really mean? You know, be okay with failure. It's to understand how, how failure works and to, to understand, um, that, you know, failure can be contained. Failure can be, you know, a, a tool for learning and failure can be measured. And so sort of building failure into your uh, process of learning and almost sort of expecting it. So now, I mean, now that I'm an entrepreneur over the last few years, I mean, I plan for failure. I mean, I literally do. I mean, I expect, I mean, if I'm doing something like literally like, you know, whenever, um, uh, there's a, a goal at hand, um, whatever that is, um, there's always for me the mindset is a lot of testing. So I got to test out uh, half a dozen different approaches towards that goal. And um, you know the the mindset I have is typically okay. Um, just the fact that I'm testing it means uh, there needs to be a process and there needs to be an outcome and there needs to be a way for me to measure it and it needs to be time bound. So it can't be endless. It needs to be okay. I'm going to test it for. 
a few weeks or a few months or maybe a year, whatever the time frame is. And then I'm going to see if I get that outcome or not. And if that is not the outcome I am hoping for, um, I'm discarding it. If that the outcome I'm hoping for, then I'm doubling down. So it's sort of the mindset of test, double down or discard. Uh, but there is no failure in there, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. the discard is now part of the process and it's not yeah. considered as failure in my mindset. It's like, okay, it didn't work now. So, you know, test out something else. But it's how I see things right now. I mean, others might think of, hey, I tried that. I spent six months doing it. I failed. Uh, for me, it's, yeah, there's going to be 10 different discards. Those are not failures. And then there's going to be one double down, which will make it happen. And usually it's faster than that. But, you know, you got to be okay with it. Yeah, and that's something we talk about a lot. We call it micro experiments. It's basically applying scientific uh, method to entrepreneurship, which I don't know why more of us don't do what you're saying and apply that principle of like trial, test, you know, control, study, and and then take the the results and iterate off of those. Either say, well, this doesn't work, so we need a new method, or there's some truth in here. Now let's let's refine this into a solution. Yeah, and I think the challenge is that, you know, most people understand the principle behind it, but, um, you know, the measuring part is where people struggle. Yeah. Because uh, it's, you know, uh, it has to be time bound. I mean, I see this as a problem in a lot of entrepreneurs. It's, um, you know, you're, um, you're, you're stuck with that idea. You need to know when to quit. And you need to know, I mean, and those are the things we need to define up front, not after the fact. Uh, because after the fact, uh, it kind of feels like a failure. It kind of feels like you're quitting. Uh, but if you, if you define it before the fact and you say, I'm going to do it for X period of time and this is the outcomes I'm looking to measure, then it's natural. Then you get to that point and say, okay, didn't get it. Now I have to, I have to leave that and go uh, try out a different approach. Um, but if you don't define it, then you get into this situation where everyone around you is aware that what you're doing for a long time is not working, but yeah. you're, you refuse to quit and you, and that's a death spiral. And, you know, and that's, you know, it's like example, I mean, in Silicon Valley, we use the pivot word pivot very loosely, but it's not a pivot. If you are at it for a few years and you failed multiple times and now you, you just don't have a choice other than doing something else. Um, you know, that's what startups say. Oh, we pivoted. I mean, we did it. We raised a bunch of money. Uh, we've lost all that money. Now we're going to do X and we call it a pivot. That's not a pivot. I mean, a pivot is a very measured tactical approach of testing some things and then moving in, in the right course of time. And you have to be very tactical about it and you have to be very, uh, you know, surgical about it versus, um, oh, I, I, I have no choice. I have to do something else right now. Yeah. Uh, that is actually a failure, which is fine. But I mean, that failure is not productive at that in that juncture, it, as it would have been if it has more if it had been more controlled earlier. Yeah, for sure. Now, one of the things I want to kind of circle back and, and ask two questions. Uh, one is about when to give up, and one is when to. Uh, uh, to to move in to something you, you mentioned risk and uh, we talk about risk in a lot in the financial world uh, you hear it a lot like how, how what's your risk tolerance uh, what are you willing to risk in this investment and, and so whether you're a person putting something into a 401k or you're put, investing in a startup uh, that's talked about a lot from the financial standpoint we need to be talking more about that in entrepreneurship our risk tolerance so part one of the question around risk is how do we see opportunities know that we are tolerant to the risk that's uh, there and then step into it and then the second part of that is how do we when we're in it whether it's a startup whether it's a long-term business know that it's time to say hey uh, the risk no longer is worth this journey. It's time for me to move on. And how can they measure that so that they know when that is and they can move into that next season? Yeah, I mean, uh, that is really, I mean, if you think about it, right, what you just said is uh, really at the end of the day, uh, the either the, the genesis for success of the company or the recipe for a disaster. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's as simple as that, but it's like, it's so hard to implement. It's so hard to implement because, um, you know, most, most times when you are in an entrepreneurial journey, um, you are uh, just, just sort of like, you know, uh, reacting to uh, the day to day. You're reacting to uh, the, the situation at hand or the environment at hand. 
And while that's okay, while that's um, natural, can't be avoided, uh, but you have to have this anchor, you have to have this sort of like this larger game plan uh, that you need to use as uh, as, a, as, a, as a ruler, as a measuring tool, and sort of, you know, to just see, see where you are with it, and are you succeeding or are you not, are you failing, and you, know, you can do it in different ways, right? So, and, and so that's what I, I, I sort of like was alluding to earlier is, you have to define some sometimes loosely, and that's okay. Um, you know, uh, a few different approaches that are possible towards uh, towards the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Okay. And there's always more, more than one approach. Um, and so you have to force yourself to say, okay, let's let's say, uh, you know, um, if you take an example and say. I want to um, I want to go um, you know uh, get some success in a particular industry vertical, and I'm going to uh, you know get a product out and and sell it at that space. And say, okay, well, what are the different ways for me to do it? I mean, uh, should I build something? Should I partner? Uh, or should I you know uh, do uh, more of a you know a platform or product or OEM strategy? There's like you have to flush that out based on specifically what you're trying to do. Yeah. And say, okay, well. How do I prioritize that? Which one do I want to uh, start first? And how much time am I going to give to each of these activities? What is a reasonable amount of time to sort of, uh, you know, uh, at least gauge if I'm moving in the right direction or if things are not working out? You have to really force yourself to define some of that and think about that, some of, some of those things up front. Um, and you could, you could always change it later if, I mean, if you are sort of like, you know, not quite there yet, but you have enough proof points to to validate that you're moving in the right direction, you could say, oh, no, I'm going to give another six months because, uh, you know, I haven't achieved the outcome, but, you know, I, 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 it's the data is there that I'm moving in the right direction. But if you define it up front, you communicate that up front to everyone in your team and say, look, we're going to try out these four things. We're going to try out this first, this second, this third, this fourth. We're going to give each of these X amount of time. These are the approaches, and this is how we're going to measure. This is the outcome that we're looking to get in 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 that reasonable amount of time frame, and this is how we're going to measure. That's what you know you you'd call OKRs, the objectives and key results. Or you could do it in any other way. We follow that in behavioral signals, and so at the end of the day, when you've defined that, then it's just pure execution. I mean, then you can take the emotion and the ego out of the equation. You know, you don't have to be right. Because you don't have to be as a CEO or as a leader say, oh, I told us to do this. Now I have to make this work because I'm going to look like uh, I put everybody on the wrong path. No, we're just saying we're going to try out these four things. Once you get to that point, then you measure it and say, OK, we're not getting the right results. I think it's time for us to move on to the next approach, which is exactly what the plan was on day one. So you're still following the plan. Everyone still feels good about you know, uh, being productive and having added value because yes, the approach one didn't work, but you had to do this to actually deduce that fact. And now that it's uh, formalized, now you can move on to the next thing, which means you actually made progress and then you go on to the next one. And so I think that's really what it is. It's all about defining some of those approaches, defining the outcomes that you're looking to do, uh, coming up with the approach to measure it, and then, you know, uh, taking the emotion and the ego out of it and just executing and just keep doing. I mean, just say, okay, I mean, I got to try out these four different things. I, I got to move through it as fast as possible. And, you know, let's get on to it and let's get the emotion out. And maybe we'll be successful on the first one, but maybe we'll be on the fourth one. But it doesn't matter. The, uh, you know, eventually we'll be successful um, if you try out all these four things. So, so, so good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, as we wrap up this first uh, segment, I we always ask these final three questions. The first one being, uh, how are you finding purpose in what you do? You know, I think you know, purpose is uh, a continuous challenge. Uh, but you know, for me, um, impact motivates me, and so for me, it's uh, you know uh, how I mean, it's two things. I mean, learning and impact. So uh, it's one inwards, one outwards. So learning is more selfish for me. It's so, okay. Well, if I'm doing something that is helping me grow and helping me add more skills and helping me be a, a better form of myself, um, then that's motivating for me. Um, I mean, and then I feel like I'm getting a lot, lot out of the time I'm putting in and my opportunity cost is being validated. And that's part of it. And the other part is impact, which is 
hey, what what I'm doing actually has impact and it's impacting you know uh, others or you know we're creating uh, opportunities or we're actually changing the world in some way by bringing a new innovation or getting into a new market or making new things happen in a space that is uh, you know impact worthy. And so it's a combination of that. I mean, so I, I, I keep gauging what I do based on those two lenses. So one is inwards, a little bit more selfish. One is outwards. Um, and sort of it's a, it's a combination of that. For you, what is one challenge you're currently working to overcome in the business? For us, you know, um, you know we, we are in a very cutting edge uh, space. Um, we, we are... Um, Sort of like pushing the boundaries on um, sort of filling out the the gaps in uh, voice interactions for artificial intelligence, and and by adding the piece of emotion recognition to a voice interaction, and so for us it's educating the market on uh, what's possible. So that's actually a typically a challenge for most AI companies, which is like you know. At the end of the day, you're bringing in a completely new set of tools that have never been ex- uh, in existence before towards uh, problems uh, that have existed for a while. And you have to educate the market on, hey, here's the new capabilities. You can use this to solve these challenges that you've been trying to solve using antiquated tools. So a big part of this challenge is educating the market. What's the next big goal you have for the business? I think. You know, the next big, uh, you know, goal for us is, uh, you know, really we've had some good initial success in some traditional verticals. Um, the next big goal for us is to diversify uh, our offering into newer verticals and also helping, uh, you know, helping uh, some uh, get uh, impacting solutions towards some of the bigger, tougher challenges like in the health tech on the robotic side. Um, really enabling that true human-to-machine interaction be as human-like as possible. And so while we've had some uh, really good success on the traditional inside sales and contact center verticals, I think some of those challenges are uh, you know, a, a little bit more daunting. So I think that's the next big goal for us is to sort of uh, make that happen. We will be right back with Rana Gujra, and we're going to go deeper into behavioral signals, the world of AI, uh, and probably talk about robotics and other things and how uh, their technology with emotional intelligence is impacting the world of AI. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll be right back. We would love to connect with you, and it's easy to do. Head on over to jumblethink.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter, find those magical links to our social channels like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And while you're there, drop us a note through our contact form or email us, hello at jumblethink. We would love to hear your stories. What's going on in your world? How are you turning your dreams and ideas into reality? And how is it changing the world around you? So head on over to jumblethink.com, drop us a note, sign up for our newsletter, or connect through our social channels, and let's chase our dreams and ideas together. Now let's jump back into our conversation with Rana Gujra. We are back with Rana Gujra. Okay, Rana, how can people find and connect with you? Um, you can connect with me in multiple ways. Um, you know, uh, you can go to my website, um, which is uh, my first and the last name, uh, Rana Gujral at uh, ranagujral.com. Uh, or you could uh, send me an email at uh, rana at ranagujral.com and follow me on Twitter. Um, there's a variety of different ways I'm, uh, I'm, I'm monitoring most of those uh, platforms, so I'd love to connect with you. And I know that Behavioral Signals, it's behavioralsignals.com. And for those listening who might be wondering how uh, do you spell this, here you go. It's R-A-N-A-G-U-J-R-A-L.com uh, and then also Behavioral Signals. Speaking of Behavioral Signals, let's talk about that. You have some great products in there, Oliver API. You have – is it Twilio? Well, Twilio is one of our uh, partner integrations. Yeah, and you've got some cool stuff. So you 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 guys are playing in the world of not playing. You're building in the world of uh, AI, but specifically from the bent of emotional intelligence and making uh, AI more uh, human. So tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, for sure. So behavioral signals uh, was founded 
based on uh, some intense research uh, that uh, our founders did uh, out of USC. And so, you know, um, our founders are uh, very, very savvy researchers in the field of behavioral science, and uh, they've been researching this for almost a decade and a half, uh, wow. even longer, I think. And uh, based on that, uh, you know, some of the some of the research has resulted in uh, basically the the birth of this emotion AI engine that that eventually led to behavioral signals. Um, what what we do with emotion AI is we uh, we we parse uh, a speech or a, a voice data in a conversation, and we we uh, we sort of uh, our capabilities are in two different buckets. So part part one is speech synthesis, which is where we dissect a conversation in terms of who's speaking, who's speaking when, um, the speaking rate, overlap ratios, et cetera, et cetera, and, 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 and parse that into also the linguistic aspects of it, which is the NLP and NLU and speech to text. And that translates into what is being said in that conversation, who's mm-hmm. saying it and what is being said. Part two of that is really the emotion engine part of it, which is we apply a variety of very specialized machine learning algorithms to uh, deduce emotions behind those words um, and, 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 and that speech. So it's not just the words which are being spoken, it's actually the tonality behind the words, which is how those words are being spoken. And so that allows us to understand if there are two people who are conversing with each other, a person one is not only saying this very accurately deduced in terms of the words which are being spoken, but what is the intent, what is the behavioral mindset, what is the emotion behind those words, such as you know, anger, happiness, uh, passiveness, engagement, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we deduce uh, about a dozen or so very, very specialized uh, signals, uh, emotional and behavioral signals, that can be deduced from uh, that 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 uh, that length of speech, and we we combine that. We combine the what is being said with how it is being said into uh, into uh, a very comprehensive set of analytics, and apply that towards a variety of different KPIs in different industries. Um, you know, which which um, you know, if you think about this, um, here's another way to look at what we do. If you look at voice interactions, voice interaction has been potentially the most fascinating field, um, you know, in in, in AI. Um, okay. It's it be, voice is the most um, natural form of communication, right? So I mean, back in the day, it was if you were communicating with a machine, uh, you were typing something or you were touching, you know, you're you're moving widgets, and that then you know, morphed into touch, which is a lot more natural for us as humans to touch. And you see like young kids, even toddlers know how to use smartphones because it's just intrinsic for them. But voice is even more intrinsic, right? Everyone knows how to speak and everyone knows how to converse with each other. uh, As long as they speak the same language, you don't even have to be educated, uh, you know, uh, or literate. You can just speak that language and understand. And so the next form of evolution for us as humans is to interact with everything around us just by voice. And that's what's starting to happen with the virtual assistants and with the robots. And, you know, we, even we talk to our TV and we talk to a remote and we talk to everything. Um, and so if you look at this whole area of voice interaction, there's been like three big components to it. One has been the traditional ASR part of it, which is the speech recognition, the speech to text or the natural language processing aspects to it. And you know, about five to seven years ago, uh, a lot of this was still in the category of uh, being cutting edge and being experimental. Fast forward to 2019, uh, it's state of the art. The NLP okay. engines out there today are so accurate that you know uh, that you could you could bet on them. And the other part is sort of like the specific context engines around you know building special specialized models and modalities around specialized domains, which is hey. You know, here's a doctor-patient conversation. Do I really understand the lingo? I mean, the terminologies between that conversation, and can I communicate that to or an educated machine uh, around that conversation? There's a lot of work that has been done over the last decade to make that also fairly state of the art. The last piece, the the missing piece, or what I feel is the holy grail of this this uh, this field, is the emotion and the intent, which is where we play. And that sort of like fills the whole, 
um, equation and it allows for that you know that interaction with the uh, inanimate system be as human like as possible and so what we do is uh, you know we, we we bring that to the equation essentially and we apply that into a variety of very specific uh, industry KPIs so you are bringing uh, emotion into the world of AI uh, mm-hmm. I know that all of us uh, have at some point engaged with AI, whether it's uh, an Amazon device, whether it's Siri, whether it's calling into a customer service line and having to go through that process. What does it mean to make it more human? How does that change our engagement with the technology, with the AI technology to improve our life or to make it more seamless so that we're having a better experience? Yeah, I mean, see, that's a fantastic question. And I think, you know, uh, oftentimes it's very difficult to sort of just understand it. So I'm going to use an example. Um, You know, today, um, I'm sure, um, you know, most of our listeners have spoken to Alexa uh, or a Google Home or a Cortana. Um, And so today, with all the all the effort that's been put in in advancing that capabilities, you say you 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 talk to uh, you know uh, let's let's compare it with a human first, then we'll compare it with an Alexa. So let's say Michael, um, you know, I ask you a question and say, um, Michael, would you like to do this? Um, and you respond back to me with a very sarcastic sure. And as a human, you know, I'm listening to your word sure, and I get that sure means uh, positive affirmation, and you know, but I can also sense the sarcasm. And I mean, and my natural response there would be, all right, maybe now's not a good time, right? Because I can see that you really don't mean it. Um, Now imagine what that interaction looks like with Alexa today. If you say, hey, Alexa, you know, Alexa asks you, would you like to do this? And you respond the same way. Alexa is going to respond with, well, great, let's do it. Um, and I mean, she has no abilities to understand uh, how and what do you really mean and what your emotional state of mind is um, when you're saying sure. And our technology really makes that possible, right? So if Alexa was using our technology, uh, she would respond similar to how I would have responded, which is, okay, maybe now is not a good time. And, um, you know, and that would now make me talk to Alexa more and treat it more like a human, which is really the goal here, which is, you know, have these virtual assistants really fill in the void in our lives and interact with them as we would interact with a human. And so that that is the magic that's possible with emotion recognition. And um, I mean, at the end of the day, when you say, um, you know, um, you want to have, uh, you know, a conversation, you know, have a, have an inanimate system speak with a human and that inanimate system could be either a virtual assistant, like, like the one we just talked about, or it could be, uh, a, 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 a point of sale device, um, at a McDonald's where you go to a touch screen and it talk takes your order and it's responding to, uh, you know, what you want. And it's also suggesting you other menu items. Uh, or it could be an assistant, uh, think of this as an assistant uh, robot at a retail shop, uh, which is helping you find the right things and making you suggestions. Uh, it's really a substitute for the, the in, in-store clerk. And I mean, all of those conversations, um, you know, have that goal of being more human-like um, and holding the conversation longer and being more helpful and being more relatable. And a big part of being human is uh, understanding emotions because we convey a lot through our emotions, not just through our words. We convey a lot through our emotions. And that, all, that, that whole thing is being missed today in those interactions. So if you add that to the equation, now you, know, you can do very, very interesting things. Like, for example, and it's not just with an uh, inanimate system or uh, a robot. It, it is between even humans to humans. Like, you know, when... When you have, um, you know, our, our clients use this for uh, debt collection. So uh, there's a lot of platforms that uh, cater especially to the debt collection market. And so you're talking to uh, a person who, uh, you know, who needs to pay his debt. And there's a collector on the call. And the, the person is saying, yeah, I'm going to pay this next week. Can you actually, uh, you know, deduce uh, his, uh, his, his propensity to pay? from the words he's using or from that conversation. And if you can, that's extremely valuable because you're going to course, you chart out the territory of what needs to happen next based on that assessment versus just the words being spoken. 
And that's how our technology is used, right? So we come up with very specialized signals of propensity to pay uh, or propensity to buy in, in, in an example where you are more of an inside sales situation where you're actually trying to sell something to the customer. Um, you know, so those are the things which are now made possible uh, by the technology, and that's how the technology is applied in a variety of different ways. You know, I was looking through your website, and I saw a couple different industries that you guys are really focused on, virtual assistants, communications, robotics, finance, healthcare, education, call centers, retail. Uh, and, and I can see in all areas where that this is possible. It was interesting as I was driving today uh, to go pick up some uh, stuff at a store. I was listening to NPR and they were talking about how technology, and I'm assuming uh, that AI is a part of this, is actually making in the world of healthcare – uh, it's it's actually freeing up doctors to have more face time than what they may have had in the past because they were dealing with other things. One of the, the things we all are struggling with, I think, in the world of, of technology is how does this impact us over the long term? If it's AI, how does this impact our jobs? If it's uh, another piece of technology like robotics, how does this change the auto industry and how does that impact jobs? Or how does it impact us on our daily interactions uh, with each other and with technology in our homes and, and smart homes? There are a lot of good things happening. There are a lot of fears that are around AI uh, for you, as you're discovering and exploring the possibilities of where you can take this technology, how are you navigating some of those complexities? Sure. Um, look, one um, common, um, I guess, concern with AI is that uh, it's, it's here or it will eventually be here to uh, replace us as humans and the jobs we do as humans. And I think that's really, really far from truth because at the end of the day, the job of artificial intelligence is to enable us, uh, enable us humans to do our job better versus replacing us. And if you look at the vast variety, if not almost the entirety of AI applications out there, um, they're all geared towards enabling humans to do their jobs better uh, versus really replacing the human quotient entirely. Uh, there are some aspects which um, obviously, you know, um, are, are, are more predictable and done better by software systems and by machines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that's just sort of like, you know, uh, it's like using a hammer uh, and it's, uh, you know, versus, uh, you know, using a blunt object and it's, it's, a, it's a better tool. And so now you can do those things faster and better. And so, like, for example, you know, what we do with emotion tech um, we, you know, if, if you have, if you have uh, an agent speaking, a call center agent, imagine a call center agent speaking with a client. I mean, the person speaks with a client day in, day out. I yeah. mean, take about, uh, you know, 50, 60, I don't know how many calls a day. It could, probably could be even more than that, 100 calls a day. Um, and so obviously as a human, you know, you have the ability to process emotions. But when you are on your 50th call in the day, and you've been doing this for the last five years, you're tuning those signals out because it's becoming very repetitive. I mean, the things which you should be catching, which is, hey, I just said something and the customer is now angry. Just based on how the customer is responding to me, I should be able to sense the anger and react to it. But I'm not even sensing it because I've tuned it out because, I mean, um, you know, I've heard that uh, phrase or that tone so many times. And that's where the tool helps in. The tool kicks in and sort of like, you know, response, you know, helps you understand the sentiment behind the, the words which are being spoken so that now you can react to it more effectively. And so that's not replacing the human quotient. That's really helping the humans do their jobs better, whatever the job is. And in that situation, it is, you know, just talking to the client. And so I think, you know, for us, it's really, you know, finding those opportunities. It's finding those opportunities where, uh, those, uh, you know, those value adds can be, can, can be provided. And I think, you know, uh, you know, and, and vast majority of the AI implementations out there really, uh, you know, really have that same goal, really have that same mindset. Uh, but oftentimes, um, you know, people, uh, people think of it as, Hey, uh, is it really going to, uh, hurt me in the long run by taking away my, my core value add or by doing the job for me? Um, I don't believe so personally. I think you know. I think there'll be minor exceptions where that will happen, but that's no different than the advent of uh, you know 
know, uh, computer software in general or any other tools out there, um, you know, uh, which, which, which again, you know, sort of uh, the purpose there is to help us rather than hurt us. So uh, some people listening, they're going to be going, hey, this really resonates with me. This might be able to help my company. How can they connect with you uh, and know if they're a good fit for what you're doing? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, we are uh, we are very uh, interested in working with um, anybody who wants to uh, try things out and push the boundaries in the tech. We have a developer program, and uh, we encourage developers and um, you know also uh, you know uh, others from the academic world to uh, freely download our APIs, sign up for a program, uh, test it out, uh, and, and play around with it and build interesting things with it. Uh, for companies that are um, that are interested in um, you know implementing this capability into their platforms or into their value propositions, uh, we have an active pilot program which we're doing with we're doing pilots uh, in many different industries. And so the best way for that is to you know go to our website uh, behavioralsignals.com and and send us a request uh, on the contact page we'll get back to you right away and we'll talk with you and see what the best fit there is is something you should try out on your own or maybe it's something we should uh, work together with and uh, we do this all the time right so we have active developers using it and we have companies that are piloting the, the tech um, and the best way to contact us would be to Again, go to uh, behavioralsignals.com and send us a request uh, from the web page, um, and we'll uh, we'll take it up from there. Super, super cool. In a moment, we'll be back with Rana to go into rapid fire questions. You've overcome the fears and doubts, and you're ready to take the leap into chasing those dreams and ideas, but you don't know where to start. Head on over to jumblethink.com slash guides. That's jumblethink.com slash guides to download our free guides to help you on the journey turning those dreams and ideas into reality. We have guides like how to know when you found your dream and the dreamer's guide to micro experiments. So head on over to jumblethink.com slash guides. That's jumblethink.com slash guides to download your free guide right now. Now let's jump into rapid fire questions with Rana Goudra. We are back with Rana. All right. Are you ready for rapid fire questions? I am ready. All right. First question is, as a child, what did you want to do when you grew up? As a child, I uh, really wanted to be a doctor. Uh, my, my parents uh, were both, uh, you know, I come from a family of doctors. So at the end of the day, that was the only thing I wanted to do uh, until I got my first computer and then everything changed. <laughs> uh, what is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea and dream and they don't know where to start? And my advice is, look, if you wait until you're ready, you're going to be waiting for the rest of your life. What so is, just, just go with it. Absolutely. Love that. What is one big lie about entrepreneurship you want to break? Uh, it's that vision of uh, being a glamorous entrepreneur who's traveling the world, um, you know, taking in all these life experiences and, um, you know, is uh, it, it, it's it's. It's a lot of hard work, guys. <laughs> it's, uh, and it's, I'll, I'll say this too, and this might be a little disappointing. It's not for everybody. Um, I mean, you kind of need to really want to do it. Um, you know, there are better ways to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> what is one change you'd like to see in the world? Empathy. I think we lack it tremendously. I think we need to uh, understand everyone has their demons, if someone's uh, reacting to you in a certain way, uh, there's a reason behind it. Uh, we need to just become more empathetic. What do you want your legacy to be? Ah, that's a tough one. I'd say, you know, like yourself, you're a, you're a dad, my legacy. I mean, if, I, um, if I'm remembered as uh, raising uh, two boys who I have as being uh, two great men, I think I'll be really proud of that. Where do you find inspiration? You know, really everywhere. I mean, I especially admire, um, you know, resilience, and I also admire an ability to deal with failure. So if I, if I, um, if I, if I come across someone, uh, it doesn't matter who they are and what they do. Um, you know, but if they're resilient and, you know, if they've had a lot of failures in their past and they've been able to deal with it, um, I get seriously inspired by that. And those, those are the things I look for and the mentors and then people I look up to. 
What is one book you think every dreamer or entrepreneur should read? <laughs> I'll give you two. Um, there's one book which has had a huge impact. Uh, that's uh, The Goal by Elahi Goldratt. And uh, that uh, speaks to a mindset of continuous innovation, and it applies to a variety of different things. I, I've read it early on in my career. It has really influenced me. And the other book I feel every entrepreneur, especially a dreamer, uh, should read about, read is uh, a, a recent book by Ryan Holiday, uh, Ego is the Enemy. And that, that speaks to how sometimes, and I see this a lot, um, you know, the act of doing something uh, is so delicious um, that you actually don't really want to actually do it. You just want to be in that act all the time. And I've been in that trap myself, and I feel every entrepreneur and every dreamer, especially in the Instagram generation, should read it. How do you define success? I mean, I think, you know, uh, for me, success is if, uh, if you've really um, given your best towards whatever you're trying to achieve, and you didn't make any of the old mistakes in the process, um, I think that's success for me. I mean, you, you're gonna. I mean, the goal is to make new mistakes, not old mistakes, and uh, you know, really make sure you give it your best, and you haven't been distracted, or you haven't been sidetracked towards your outcome. And um, if that's done, I think I'm successful. Um, you know, I measure that as success. What is one trend you're currently excited about? Um, I think you know. Uh, the, the current trend is, I mean, I, I think, you know, just the general feel, field of what's happening in the AI market um, and in general sort of evolution of some of these core capabilities, which are now making these use cases possible. I'm extremely, extremely excited about that. And I'm very, um, you know, thankful that we're able to play in that space. What is one habit that's helpful in your life as an entrepreneur? Uh, we talked about this earlier. I, you know, I have this serious internalization of uh, embracing discomfort yeah. and, and, and seeking chaos. And I live by that. And I think this is one habit which not only allows me to really perceive success as it is and failure as it is, but also just manage the whole process of learning. What is one thing you wish you would have known when you first started out? Oh, yeah. This is my favorite. Uh, <laughs> I wish... I wish I hadn't played it too safe. Uh, in fact, you know, this is one thing which someone asked me is like, what would you say to a 20 year old? And I'd say, don't play it too safe. It's not worth the risk. Uh, I love that. Don't play it too safe. It's not worth the risk. That is such a great statement. I think that's our quote of the episode for sure. <laughs> if you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? Oh, if I could. Uh, and if I had the abilities for it, I'd love to uh, do what Anthony Bourdain was doing. I think that would be an ideal job for me uh, if I was an entrepreneur. And our final question is, what is one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? Yeah, I mean, it's a dream slash goal. Um, I mean, I think more of a goal than a dream, but it's a combination of both. I mean, I do uh, eventually want to write a book uh, that, uh, that leaves an impact. Not just write a book for the sake of writing a book, but something – that eventually does have impact and leaves an impact. And I feel it would be so fulfilling to have sort of, you know, put that out there uh, as part of your, uh, as part of your offering um, and, you know, all the learnings and all the, you know, uh, things uh, that I have absorbed and, and sort of condense that and put it out there. Um, so that's a dream. That's a goal. Um, not sure when I'm going to get to it because it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> As we wrap up today's episode, we always like to leave you have a final uh, final thought for us. So what's your final thought for all of us today? I, I think the final thought is, um, you know, guys, I mean, this, this is, I mean, entrepreneurship is, is a beautiful journey and, um, you know, but it needs to be, uh, it needs to be grounded into reality. It needs to be uh, backed by certain goals, um, you know, one needs to be also uh, very introspective in terms of, like, you know, what are you trying to achieve and what are you trying to do? And I feel um, a, a lot of us, a lot of us don't take the time to think through it. In fact, you know, I, you know, I personally feel that most people and some, you know, have circumstances which make it harder for them, but most people don't really stop and reflect on what is it that they actually want to do? 
um, and they're just in the day to day. They're just doing things because that's what is expected of them. I really encourage everyone to, you know, take that time uh, and to self reflect. Doesn't matter if you're 18 or you're 55. Uh, is to really reflect and just sort of say, okay, the next five years, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, whatever um, you know is the, the span of my career, uh, I, I want to do that, or at least I want to have that in the back of my mind. But I feel that most people don't do that. They just don't. I mean, they haven't taken that time to think about it. Rana, thank you so much for taking time out, sharing us, uh, sharing with us the story of behavioral signals, sharing a little bit of your story. It's been an honor to have you on with us today. Thank you, Michael. It's a, it's a sincere pleasure as well. Appreciate your invite and uh, thank you for having me here. Once again, we want to thank today's guest, Rana Gujral, for taking time out and being with us today. You can check him out at ranagujral.com and also behavioralsignals.com. Com. We'd love to hear from you and what you thought of today's episode. Drop me an email, hello at jumblethink.com. We'd love to hear your stories. And now it's your turn to take your ideas and dreams, to take the next step to leap into the unknown and begin to turn those dreams and ideas that you have deep inside of you into reality. The world needs you now more than ever to become all that you were created to be and to offer that to the world. I believe your dreams and ideas will impact the people around you and your impact will have a lasting impact on the world around you. So go chase those dreams and turn them into reality and change the world around you. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois. Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.